this is this is Easter Sunday, and, and it's the day that we get to celebrate, not only because there's plenty of reason to celebrate Good Friday because of the sacrifice of Jesus, because he shed his blood for our sins, but Easter gives us extra to celebrate because he provides us with life and life abundantly and life eternal. And so we're very thankful for that. I'm going to pray, and then we're just going to jump right into it this morning. Lord Jesus, thank you for this morning. I thank you for everyone who has come to join in celebrating your resurrection, that you are alive, that you are seated at the right hand of the Father because your work is complete. You uh, told us so as you, you ushered your last words on the cross that it is finished. And um, we praise you, Lord, that there is nothing else that we have to do other than receive your free gift of grace that you provided for us. I thank you for opening the way. Jesus, we thank you for being the way, the truth, and the life, and that no one comes to the Father but through you. Bless us this morning. I know that you will through the declaration of your word of truth. May it um, fill our hearts afresh to leave this place with joy and gladness. In Jesus' name, amen. Well, good morning. Again, well, welcome to, to Calvary Laramie. I, I just wanted to jump right in. We're going to just jump right in talking about the Gospels. And, and talking about the Gospels, they're an amazing compil compilation of the record of Jesus' life from this quadraphonic point of view. We have four different records that really complement each other and how they record what Jesus did, with four different men taking up the task to put down on paper what they or people close to them witnessed during the time of Jesus' life on earth. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John all record for us a biography of Jesus. Their biographies are un unique, however, when comparing them to other biogra biographies you may have read or that have been written, you might ask, well, what do you mean by that? Well, Bible commentator Warren Wiersbe has a good answer for that question. He writes, I am an incurable reader of biographies, and I notice that almost all of them conclude with the death and burial of the subject. I have yet to read one that describes the subject's resurrection from the dead. The fact that the Gospels continue their account and share the excitement of the resurrection miracle is proof that Jesus is not like any other man. He is indeed the Son of God. And this truly is the most amazing part of the historical record of Jesus. He is unlike any other religious founder or normal person for that matter because he is not dead. He is living. He has no gravestone or gravesite to visit to remember him. His is an empty tomb. I was listening to a pastor named Colin Smith this week and in his teaching he noted the resurrection is the crown jewel of, Christi of the Christian faith. And the fact that Jesus is alive, it changes everything. And I want to examine um, this idea more with you this morning. But before we do, the, we first need to do a brief review of what has happened, what transpired over the course of this week. What did the Gospels record for us in Jesus' life? Last week, we had the privilege of celebrating Palm Sunday as we examine how Jesus is praised and welcomed into the city of Jerusalem by a throng of people the city, the city is filled to overflowing with faithful Jews there to celebrate Passover. And it is on that day that God chose to ordain his Messiah. And he planned it out from the beginning that on that day, Jesus would be revealed as his chosen one. From gotquestions.org, just to give you a definition of what Messiah means, that it is the chosen one. It comes from the Hebrew word Mashiach, and it means anointed one or chosen one. The Greek equivalent is the word Christos, or in English, Christ. It's not just Jesus' last name, Jesus Christ, but it refers to his title, that he is the chosen one, and he stands apart. In biblical times, anointing someone with oil was a sign that God was consecrating or setting apart that person for a particular role. Thus, an anointed one was someone with a special God-ordained purpose. The special God-ordained purpose for Jesus was to redeem people from 
their sin. You see, the Jewish people and, and the Jewish people of the day didn't understand this. And we explored that idea last week that they were expecting a political Messiah, a physical deliverer, not a spiritual one. And this fact becomes more apparent as the events of Holy Week play out that um, Jesus first makes waves as he clears the temple of the money changers and merchants on Monday. He teaches and heals in the temple on Tuesday and has continual run-ins with the religious leaders and answers all of their questions and objections. It's Jesus' inspection process as he's presented as the Lamb of God who takes away the sin of the world he has this opportunity to be inspected, and he passes every single, checks every box, every inspection he passes, and qualifies to be the pure, spotless lamb who is offered for sin once and for all. Later in the week, we read that he withdraws with his disciples to teach them and to leave them with peace and encouragement as they celebrate the Passover supper to, together. And then if you're reading the, the record, it's almost like the unthinkable happens as one of Jesus' own followers betrays him. Judas Iscariot sells Jesus out for 30 pieces of silver and hands him over to the temple guards as they come to arrest Jesus and take him away at the garden. And he's then taken away to be unjustly tried, questioned, falsely accused, all under the cloak of night, and then into the early morning hours of Friday, Jesus is tried before the Roman governor, Pontius Pilate. He's beaten, mocked, ridiculed, placed before an angry mob where he's condemned to death. Jesus is then led to the hill of Calvary, Golgotha, the place of the skull, where he's nailed to the cross and crucified. He hangs on the cross for six hours, and as the cup of God's wrath is poured out on him, the punishment for sin, Jesus takes on the sin of the world. And as that process progresses, the sky darkens, and, and finally Jesus gives up his spirit, crying with his last breath that it is finished. Amazing events then transpire at his death. The temple veil is torn in two. There's a great earthquake. If you read in Matthew, there's actually people that are raised from the dead on the day that Jesus died. Incredible things happened. The soldiers present are even willing to admit that truly this man was, was the son of God. And then the soldiers present pierce Jesus' side and confirm his death. Then we see two followers of Jesus come out of the, out of the woodwork, a man named Joseph of Arimathea, along with Nicodemus. They ask for permission to bury Jesus in Joseph's own tomb. They wrap him in linen and bury him with a hundred pounds of spices, a mixture that they had put together just for this day. A large stone is then placed over the entrance of the tomb, and the place is sealed and guarded by, a Ro by Roman soldiers, and in the mind of Jesus' followers, it's over. Everything, everything that they thought of Jesus, that, they, that he was going to be their leader forever, it all came crumbling down. Their leader is gone. He's dead. It's, it's over. And as I mentioned earlier, this is the place where a typical biography would end. But not Jesus' biography. And so, if you want to make your way, we're going to just be reading the account from John chapter 20. And um, it's an amazing chapter. Verse 1. John chapter 20, verse 1. If you want, if you're, if you're new to us, if you, if you have the YouVersion app, the Bible app, you can follow along there. I have my outline, and there's a lot of added content if you want to do some extra reading, some, some ar helpful articles and encouraging ones. Anyways, John chapter 20, starting in verse 1. Now, on the first day of the week, Mary Magdalene went to the tomb early while it was still dark and saw that the stone had been taken away from the tomb. Then she ran and came to Simon Peter and to the other disciple whom Jesus loved and said to them, They have taken away the Lord out of the tomb, and we do not know where they have laid him. Peter therefore went out and the other disciple and were going to the tomb. So they both ran together, and the other disciple outran Peter and came to the tomb first. And he, stooping down and looking in, saw the linen cloths lying there, yet he did not go in. 
Then Simon Peter came, following him, and went into the tomb. And he saw the linen cloths lying there, and the handkerchief that had been around his head, not lying with the linen cloths, but folded together in a place by itself. Then the other disciple, who came to the tomb first, went in also, and he saw and believed. For as yet they did not know the scripture, that he must rise again from the dead. Then the disciples went away again to their own homes. But Mary stood outside by the tomb weeping, and as she wept, she stooped down and looked into the tomb, and she saw two angels in white sitting, one at the head and the other at the feet where the body of Jesus had lain. Then they said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? She said to them, Because they have taken away my Lord, and I do not know where they have laid him. Now when she had said this, she turned around and saw Jesus standing there and did not know that it was Jesus. Jesus said to her, Woman, why are you weeping? Whom are you seeking? She, supposing him to be the gardener, said to him, Sir, if you have carried him away, tell me where you have laid him, and I will take him away. Jesus said to her, Mary. And she turned and said to him, Rabboni, which is to say, Teacher. Jesus said to her, Do not cling to me, for I have not yet ascended to my father. But go to my brethren and say to them, I am ascending to my father and your father and to my God and your God. Mary Magdalene came and told the disciples that she had seen the Lord and that he had spoken these things to her. Then, the same day at evening, being the first day of the week, when the doors were shut, where the disciples were assembled, for fear of the Jews, Jesus came in and stood in their midst and said to them, Peace be with you. When he had said this, he showed them his hands and his side. Then the disciples were glad when they saw the Lord. So Jesus said to them again, Peace to you. As the Father has sent me, I also send you. And when he had said this, he breathed on them and said to them, Receive the Holy Spirit. If you forgive the sins of any, they are forgiven them. And if you retain the sins of any, they are retained. Now Thomas, called the twin, one of the twelve, was not with them when Jesus came. The other disciples therefore said to him, We have seen the Lord. So he said to them, Unless I see in his hands the print of the nails and put my finger into the print of the nails and put my hand into his side, I will not believe. And after eight days, his disciples were again inside and Thomas with them. Jesus came, the doors being shut, and stood in the midst and said, Peace to you. Then he said to Thomas, Reach your finger here and look at my hands. And reach your hand here and put it into my side. Do not be unbelieving, but believing. And Thomas answered and said to him, My Lord and my God. Jesus said to him, Thomas, because you have seen me, you have believed. Blessed are those who have not seen and yet have believed. And truly, Jesus did many other signs in the presence of his disciples, which are not written in this book. But these are written, that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. Today we've already looked from the cross to the grave in reviewing Jesus' final week on the earth. We're now going to be stepping into, I would like to approach the resurrection and answer some objections. We'll examine the evidence and we'll also examine the witnesses. And then we'll ask the question, why does it matter? We'll be looking at the sin problem and the death problem that plagues plagues humanity. And then closing with a few thoughts from there. The first thing I wanted to do this morning as we approach the resurrection of Jesus is to answer some objections. When it comes to the subject of Jesus' resurrection, his bodily resurrection, there are a lot of skeptics, haters, and detractors. So let's examine some objections, shall we? And then compare the evidence that we have. First, objections and or denials of Jesus' resurrection are not a new thing. From the very first day that Jesus' body was not found in the tomb in which it was laid, there have been deniers. In Matthew's gospel, we read about such deniers. In Matthew 28, 11 through 15, we read that, Now while they were going, behold, some of the guard came into the city and reported to the chief priests all the things that had happened. When they had assembled with the elders and consulted together, they gave a large sum of money to the soldiers, saying, Tell them his disciples came at night and stole him away while we slept. 
And if this comes to the governor's ears, we will appease him and make you secure. So they took the money and did as they were instructed. And this saying is commonly reported among the Jews until this day. So those were the first detractors, the first deniers of the resurrection. Modern day deniers have come up with such theories as the swoon theory. That Jesus, having endured 39 lashes from a Roman whip and then being hung on a cross, that that wasn't enough to kill him, that he was simply overwhelmed and passed out. Then it wasn't enough that then that he was tightly wrapped in linen cloths where he most likely would have suffocated to death. And then not only that, was then covered with a 100 pounds of spices adding to the suffocation factor. No, all of that did not kill Jesus. He was simply passed out, laid in the tomb. The coolness of the tomb revived him and he then came back to life. Not resurrected, but resuscitated. I think you can see how that theory is easily debunked. There's also the replacement theory. This, this theory is held even by some religions, that it wasn't Jesus who actually went to the cross, but somebody else who looked like him was sent to the cross, and that person died, not Jesus. There's also the hallucination theory, which we'll examine, so I won't go into that. And I believe simply examining the story that the Roman soldiers are instructed to, to circulate proves Jesus' resur resurrection rather than negating it. First, if they were sleeping, as is the corroborated story, how would they know it was the disciples who stole Jesus' body? They were sleeping, after all. Second, if Jesus' body was stolen, it was either taken by his enemies or his friends. His enemies would not want the body stolen, so as to falsely suggest that he had risen as he said he would. After all, this is the very thing that they were trying to prevent. Also, if they had taken Jesus' body, they could simply produce it and prove, oh, we have Jesus' body. He's dead. Here, see where it lays. And the second point on this, uh, that Jesus' body could not have been stolen, Jesus' friends would not have taken it because they were convinced he was dead. They, they were convinced of it. And, and that's one thing that I want to encourage you. If you are a skeptic of Jesus' resurrection, consider yourself in good company because Jesus' own followers were skeptics on this day. Thirdly, if the body of Jesus had been stolen, the grave clothes would have gone with it. However, in each of the gospel accounts, it is said that the place where Jesus was laid was examined. And here in John's gospel, we actually read that the grave clothes of Jesus are still inside the tomb with no body in them. Adam Clark rightly observes, here is a whole heap of absurdities. Warren Wiersbe adds, any sincere person who studies this evidence with an open heart will conclude that the resurrection of Jesus Christ is a historic fact that cannot be refuted. With that being said, now let's examine some evidence. First, we have an empty tomb. This place was sealed, it was guarded, and it was secure. Yet here we find it open and empty. The empty tomb is then witnessed by the various women who were there that morning, along with Peter and John. Second, God explains the message of the empty tomb through his messengers. In Luke 24, we read that simply examining the empty tomb left the women confused. It didn't really answer any questions. They were perplexed, it says in Luke 24. Pick it up in verse 2. We read that they found the, the stone rolled away from the tomb. Then they went in and did not find the body of the Lord Jesus. And it happened as they were greatly perplexed about this, that behold, two men stood by them in shining garments. Then, as they were afraid and bowed their faces to the earth, they said to them, Why do you seek the living among the dead? He is not here, but is risen. God tells the women, by his angels, what has happened. Jesus is risen. He's alive. He's not dead. So for evidence, we have an empty, open tomb. We have abandoned grave clothes. We have eyewitnesses. We have messengers from heaven to interpret the scene. And all of this 
should be enough evidence. It should be sufficient. Maybe it's not. Maybe the empty tomb itself is not sufficient for you. Well, we also have eyewitnesses who saw Jesus himself in the flesh, in his resurrected body, as he makes multiple appearances after he has been raised from the dead. To help in summarizing the witness list, Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15, 5 through 8, that he was seen, so that is Jesus, Paul's making his list. He was seen by Cephas, that is Peter, then by the twelve, the disciples. After that, he was seen by over 500 brethren at once, of whom the greater part remain to the present, but some have fallen asleep, that is, some of them have already died. After that, he was seen by James, then by all the apostles, then last of all, he was seen by me also, as by one born out of due time. So, Jesus makes multiple appearances after he has risen from the dead and is seen by multiple eyewitnesses. Referencing back to the hallucination theory I mentioned earlier, there are many problems with this theory. But I will offer you some, and, and so I wanted to look up and offer you some professional observation from two psychologists commenting on the subject. Clinical psychologist Gary A. Sibke has commented, I have surveyed the professional literature peer-reviewed journal articles and books, journal articles and books, written by psychologists, psychiatrists, and other relevant healthcare professionals during the past two decades, and have yet to find a single documented case of a group hallucination. That is, an event for which more than one person purportedly shared in a visual or other sensory perception where there was clearly no external referent. Psychologist Gary Collins adds, hallucinations are individual occurrences. By their very nature, only one person can see a given hallucination at a time. They certainly aren't something which can be seen by a group of people. Neither is it possible that one person could somehow induce a hallucination in somebody else, since a hallucination exists only in this subjective, personal sense. It is obvious that others cannot witness it. Charles Spurgeon uh, commenting kind of in this same context, I suppose, brethren, that we may have persons arise who will doubt whether there was ever such a man as Julius Caesar or Napoleon Bonaparte, and when they do, when all reliable history is flung to the winds, then but not till then, may they begin to question whether Jesus Christ rose from the dead. For this historical fact is attest attested by more witnesses than almost any other fact that stands on record in history, whether sacred or profane. So, the question that then remains, and you may be asking yourself, why does it matter? I hope the case has been laid before you that you may interpret it, but why does it matter for you, for me? in the here and now, today. First and foremost, we need to look at mankind as a whole and the two great problems that we all face, the problem of sin and the problem of death. What is sin? The answer is that sin is transgressing the law of God. If you want to simplify the law of God, well, what is it? We find the law of God in its summarized form in the Ten Commandments in Exodus chapter 20. If you examine and go through like a checklist to examine our own hearts, you can ask yourself, because it's in there, have you, have you ever lied? Have you ever stolen something? Have you ever committed adultery? Jesus takes that to the next step. Have you ever looked on someone with lust while you've committed adultery in your heart? Have you ever used God's name in vain? Well, if you check off any of those four, maybe all four, you have four broken commandments that you've reached already, not even looking at the other six that remain. And the consequences for breaking God's standard are dire. We read in Romans 6.23 that the wages of sin, the wages of breaking God's law, is death. So as a human race, we have a sin problem that leads to a death problem, and death is something that we all face. I hate to break it to you, the mortality rate is 100%. You will die someday. It's a promise. It's a fact. Colin Smith 
writes, Death is like a tyrant exercising a reign of terror over the entire human race. Who can escape it? And this is where Jesus comes in. He came to pay the fine for our transgression. Standing before the judge, you come in with a stack of speeding tickets to present yourself before the judge. You are guilty. Yet, what happens is someone comes in and on your behalf pays your fine. And what the judge can do at that point by the rule of law is allow you to go free because the fine has been paid. Well, we stand condemned before the judge of the entire universe, God the Father, with a sack of fines beyond anything that we could ever repay on our own. And Jesus comes in as our holy representative and saying, hey, I've paid Nate's stack of fines so that he can go free. Jesus has paid the fine that is due on account of sin. This leads me to the point to the point of the significance of the resurrection. Back to Pastor Colin Smith as he observes, Jesus has cut a hole in death that once we go in, there is now a way to get out. The fact that Jesus is risen means that death is defeated. And as Paul makes a case in 1 Corinthians 15, if Christ has been raised, then there is hope of a resurrection for all of us. I'll just read to you what Paul writes in 1 Corinthians 15. Starting in verse 12. He reads, Now if Christ is preached that he has been raised from the dead, how do some among you say that there is no resurrection of the dead? But if there is no resurrection of the dead, then Christ is not risen. And if Christ is not risen, then our preaching is empty, and your faith is also empty. Yes, and we are found false witnesses of God, because we have testified of God that he raised up Christ, whom he did not raise up, if in fact the dead do not rise. For if the dead do not rise, then Christ is not risen, and if Christ is not risen, your faith is futile, and you are still in your sins. Paul's like asking us to follow him along this logical path. Do you see where this goes? Then also those who have fallen asleep in Christ have perished. And if in this life only we have hope in Christ, we are of all men the most pitiable. And then Paul continues in verse 20, But now Christ is risen from the dead and has become the first fruits of those who have fallen asleep. In other words, leaving us an example of what the resurrection, what the resurrection looks like. To give a simple summary, David Guzik breaks down Paul's logic point by point. If there's no principle of resurrection, then Jesus did not rise from the dead. If Jesus did not rise from the dead, then death is power over him and defeated him. If death is power over Jesus, he is not God. If Jesus is not God, he cannot offer a complete sacrifice for sins. If Jesus cannot offer a complete sacrifice for sins, our sins are not completely paid for before God. My sins are not completely paid for before God, then I am still in my sins. Therefore, if Jesus is not risen, he is unable to save. Warren Rearsby adds an integral part of the gospel message is the fact of Christ's resurrection. After all, a dead Savior cannot save anybody. The fact of Jesus' resurrection leaves us with great and precious promises. First, we have the promise of eternal life. John 3.16, For God so loved the world that he gave his one and only Son, that whoever believes in him should not perish but have everlasting life. Second, we have a promise of new and resurrected bodies, modeled after Jesus' new and resurrected body. Jesus is the prototype of the resurrection. 1 John 3, 2 declares, Beloved, now we are children of God, and it has not yet been revealed what we shall be, but we know that when he is revealed, we shall be like him, for we shall see him as he is. We'll have resurrected bodies, just like Jesus, renewed and refreshed. We can teleport, walk through walls, appear in, in rooms, all like Jesus did. Third, we have a promise of an eternal dwelling place. One of the great things that I was able to dwell on this week is, is how Jesus comforted his disciples during this last week that he spent with them. 
And in John 14, he tells them, let not your heart be troubled. You believe in God, believe also in me. In my Father's house are many mansions. If it were not so, I would have told you. I go to prepare a place for you. And if I go and prepare a place for you, I will come again and receive you to myself, that where I am, there you may be also. And we know that Jesus has ascended to heaven. He has sat down at the right hand of the Father. And so since Jesus is away, he's preparing a place. And since Jesus is preparing a place, he intends to invite us to that same place and welcome us in to eternity. To close our time this morning, I want to leave you with a few thoughts, maybe challenge you to make your own assessment and decision on what we've examined this morning. We can examine evidence all day long, but the question comes down to what are you going to do with that evidence? What am I going to do with the evidence that has been given? After all, as we read in John chapter 20, and the, the main reason I picked this passage is for the purpose of verse 31. This is the summary statement of John's gospel. He writes, But these are written that you may believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that believing you may have life in his name. David Cusick writes, John understood that faith in Jesus as Messiah and God had value beyond the honorable recognition of truth. It also carried the promise of life in his name. This was life that transformed John himself, and he wanted that same life and transformation for all through his gospel account. This belief isn't complicated. Our response is as simple as ABC, accept, believe, and commit. It isn't always easy, but it isn't complicated. The case has been made, and so the ball is now in your court. What are you to do with it? To give you kind of the, I don't know if you've ever heard of it, but the Roman road of the gospel and the invitation, Romans 3.23 declares, For all have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. It's all-inclusive. Nobody, nobody is separated from the all of Romans 3.23. All have sinned and fallen short of the glory of God. We have to admit, and so then with this being the declaration, we have to admit and accept God's assessment of it by his word. Do we, and I guess this gets into a different conversation, is like, do we believe that God holds authority? And if he does, then, then do we then believe what he says and hold that in authority? You may ask, well, well how do I know what God says? He's given us his written word. This is the full declaration of it. He doesn't need anything else. This is the complete record of what God would have for us to believe. So, firstly, we have to admit and accept God's assessment, assessment of us from his word, that we are sinners. Second, then we have to accept the consequences for our sin and our sinful state. Romans 6.23 says the wages of sin is death. So I'm a sinner. I'm headed for death. This is where God enters into the equation. And the very reason we celebrate during this season of Easter. This is why we're here on Resurrection Sunday, if you didn't know. That the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. The wages of sin is death, but the gift of God is eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. It's a testament of God's love, what he has done. That he desires that none should perish, but all would receive the free gift of salvation. And Romans 5 8 declares for us this that God demonstrates his own love toward us, and that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. And then that puts the responsibility in our court. The responsibility becomes ours to agree with God's assessment, to acknowledge that he has provided the way of salvation. It's not something that I can do. It's not something that I can earn, but it is confessing to what God has already done. And then in Romans 10, 9, we read that if you confess with your mouth the Lord Jesus and believe in your heart that God has raised him from the dead, you will be saved. And in verse 13, we read the promise, whoever calls on the name of the Lord shall be saved. 
And then the result is everlasting. We can be reconciled to a holy God. We can have peace with him and have access to the gift of salvation, the gift of eternal life that he promises through his son, Jesus Christ. And that brings us to Romans 5 once again. Therefore, having been justified by faith, that is, we believe in what God has said, we believe in what he has assessed of us as, as, as human beings, we accept what God has done in sending his son. And that leads us then to be justified by faith and having peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ, through whom also we have access by faith into this grace in which we stand and rejoice in hope of the glory of God. I wanted to leave you with one final story. Warren Rusby records um, a man named Dr. Robert W. Dale, who was one of Great Britain's leading congressional pastors and theologians. And one day he was studying and preparing an Easter sermon when a realization of the risen Lord struck him with new power. Christ is alive, he said to himself. Can that really be true? Living as really as I myself am. He got up from his desk and began to walk about the study, repeating, Christ is living. Christ is living. Dr. Dale had known and believed this doctrine for years, but the reality of it overwhelmed him that day. And from that time on, the living Christ was the theme of his preaching, and he had his congregation sing an Easter hymn every Sunday morning. He stated, I want my people to get hold of the glorious fact that Christ is alive and to rejoice over it. And Sunday, you know, is the day on which Christ left the dead. So the summary statement I want to leave you with this morning, historical faith says says Christ lives. I believe that that fact is well established. Saving faith says Christ lives in me. What are we to do with the historical fact that Christ is risen? Do you have saving faith? Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you that up from the grave you arose and that because you live, we can face tomorrow. Because you live, all fear is gone. Because I know you hold the future and life is worth the living just because you live. Jesus, I thank you for simplifying the process. Lord, it tells us in... in, um, in Romans and in 1 Corinthians, that by one man, sin entered the world and death through sin, so that by one man, Jesus, you might give us life and you might give us redemption from sin. I thank you, Lord, for the cross of Christ, that it, that it is the defining moment of all of human history. That those who lived before it looked toward it with expectancy and hope that their sin might be atoned for. That we who live after it might look back with praise, thanking you for the work that you've accomplished. Lord Jesus, it is by your precious blood that we are saved. Thank you for being the Lamb of God who has taken away the sin of the world. I pray especially on this morning that anyone who is not saved by your grace would be able to humbly approach your throne and ask for your forgiveness. That that they would come to that place of being willing to admit and agree with your assessment. We're sinners in need of a Savior. But man, that's why you came. So Jesus, thank you for this morning. Thank you for Resurrection Sunday, for the promise of eternal life in the here and now that you gave us your Holy Spirit to live within us, to give us abiding and abundant life on the day to day, and then as a deposit to cash in for our eternal life in the future. Thank you that we don't have to fear death because you have conquered it. You went in, knocked down the door of death and gave us a way to pass through it. For giving us life in your name. 
Thank you, Jesus, for the resurrection. And it's in your name we pray, the mighty name of Jesus. Amen.